Judy, this is um, totally off topic for what I normally do, but there you go, such is life. Um, in my feed fairly recently there's been a few videos which have covered these things, which are Roman artifacts, which are dodecahedral in, in form. Um, they're cast and then shaped by hand, they've got uh, knobs soldered on the corners, got holes of different sizes all the way around them and nobody knows what the hell they were for. There's not very many of them that have been found this far. There's been quite a few fragments but um, but yeah um, there's quite a lot of them and nothing in the extant Roman literature references them or discusses them in any way. Now one of the things that's cropped up in my feed is a set of videos by this guy, Matt Geven, who seems to be um, a pretty nice bloke. Um, and he's got his theory as to what they are. Um, I would suggest that you go and watch his videos now. Um, I don't agree with his thesis. But um, you should definitely go and watch his, his videos, because otherwise you won't understand what the fuck I'm talking about, for a start. And um, you won't understand what his theory is. Um, if nothing else, they are very entertaining. I was entertained. So, if you haven't already, go and watch them now. Right. Are we back? Um... Now, as part of uh, Matt's theory, which I disagree with for a number of reasons, um, mostly um, mostly because the dodecahedron is irrelevant to his theory entirely, um, you wouldn't need it, um, but there's also the fact that um, the dodecahedrons that have been found in context have been found in a totally non-military context, as tomb items for a uh, for a rich person, and within what's believed to have been a shop selling valuable items, so yeah, uh, non-military. Um, and there's also there's also what other issues are there? There's well, there's a whole bunch of issues with them really, but uh, but there you go. Also, I think. The fact that Matt makes a point of travelling all the way up to, to Corbridge, up to the Roman Wall, to go and see this one, um, is a little bit disingenuous. The majority of them have been found in southern England. Only two have been found in the north. Um, his opinion that their military is you know, pushing, pushing them out to the far reaches of the Roman Empire, I think, is a bit off. Anyway... That being as it may, uh, what we're going to get on to is uh, his proof, his evidence that this is what it is. Um, now, further on in this video here, the, uh, the evidence, um, he comes up with this object here, which is a fragment of Roman wood, which lived in a peat bog for the best part of 1800 years. Um, and you'll notice, if you look carefully, over on the left, I've got it in Inkscape. Um, now, this is, as Matt claims, or well, this is Matt claims, not as Matt claims, this is Matt claims, um, a decoding disc for a dodecahedron, uh, which was being made, got broken, and got binned, and that's how it survived. Now, um, if we look at it, uh, on the face of it, we've got a hole in the middle that could be a pivot. Yeah, okay, pivot hole. We've got a couple of radially, radially drilled holes, which appear to be on the same uh, on the same radius. Yeah, okay. And the angles looked at like that do suggest pentagonal shape. But what we've got here, we've also got a scale, and Matt doesn't seem to have done his done his homework. So what we're going to do is we're going to do Matt's homework for him. So let's go to Inkscape and let's bring it up to full screen. Um, I have drawn a circle. Oh, bugger. Um, I have drawn a circle around the centre of this dodecahedron. 
um, the circle is here and it is centered on the center of the center pivot hole of this dodecahedron and we can see that during its stay underground in the bog uh, the wood has been distorted that's because wood is not a dimensionally stable material when it gets moist it expands when it gets dry it contracts anybody who's lived on the fens knows what bog oak is uh, now so what we've got here is this we are going to resize this to bring it back to its original not necessarily its original dimensions exactly but at least its original proportions so we select the image and we're going to handy dandily bring it up like that now what that gives us is the ability to now measure using Inkscape and uh, take the measurements and lay them against this rather nifty little scale. Now the problem with Inkscape is that it measures in millimetres but they're on screen millimetres and I have not rescaled this so that those measurements are exact so we will need to make some, you know, some double measurements basically. So let's go to the measurement tool First thing we're going to look at is the radius of the hole in the middle. No, sorry, diameter of the hole in the middle. Now, according to this, 15.4 millimeters, 15.5 millimeters, um, or thereabouts. So, if we come to here and we go 15, yeah, 15 minutes or so, it's about nine millimeters. Maybe it was target practice. Sorry, that's rather facetious. Now, what we're going to look at is we're going to check that the uh, the two holes are on the same radius. So if we come from here, we can come around to there, and we can bring our radius around to here, and they look to be roughly on the same radius. And that's good. And what we, what we can do is we can stop doing that. Um, we can look at the radius itself. So the radius to here is according to Inkscape, about 55 and a half millimetres from the centre of here to the centre of that hole. Inkscape terms, we'll need to take these off of here, but we'll also look at this angle here, which is about 26 degrees. We'll need that in a minute. So, 55.5 or thereabouts, so if we come to 50, uh, 51, 2, 3, 4, Five and a half, fifty-five and a half. That lines up more or less with the thirty-three millimeter scale point. So a radius of about thirty-three millimeters. Now, um, what we want to also know is the angle between these two holes relative to the center. And Inkscape won't let me measure just between two lines like that, so we're going to need to rotate the whole thing. That's why we needed that 26 degrees. So let's uh, come out of there. Yep. Go to our layers. We select everything. We go to here. We're going to rotate by minus 26 degrees. That brings these two holes onto a horizontal. We can go back to measuring tool from the center of there to there, bring it round, and we get about 80, 81 degrees. Now, 80 or 81 degrees is an awful long way off of the 72 degrees that we need for a pentagon. And if you were making a coding disk to fit on a regular pentagon, and you got your holes off by the best part of 10 degrees, it ain't gonna work. So, um, let's assume that Matt's thesis that this got broken while drilling a hole and got binned is wrong, but that his thesis it's a decoding disk is correct. We'll say that they messed up the hole spacing and went, oh, bollocks, and binned it. Okay, so, 33 millimeter radius. And we've got some holes which are, oops, stop it, so about 8 millimetres in, uh, 
eight millimeter diameter, yeah, thereabouts. Holes that are one, two, three, four, about five millimeters, four and a half, five millimeters wide. They're quite small holes actually for a, for a, for a Roman period thing, but there you go. So 33 millimeter radius. Now to get the uh, the hole spacing, the side length of a uh, of a pentagon from its radius, um, you can look up on the internet, double check me, but you multiply the radius by 1.45, and that's what we're going to do. So let's bring up as the calculator. Oh, we've already got the result. How about that? 33 times 1.45. Five equals 47.85 or 48 millimeters. So 48 millimeters, a couple of inches between holes on a correctly spaced pentagonal disc. So what we need to do now is compare that to the side length of existing pentagons. Well, but we don't know that, Simon, you might say. But we do. There's a whole bunch of them that we know about. Not only the Corbridge one, but uh, let's look here. This this is finds.org.uk, which is the uh, portable antiquities scheme. It's a uh, it's a self uh, self reporting site for for antiquities, um, and there's quite a few dodecahedrons on here, dodecahedrons and fragments. And now this one has been looked at by Lorena Hitchens, who's known as Dodecahedra Girl. Um, she knows an awful lot about these things. Um, it's a rather good one, which was found in... Uh, I forget where it says at the bottom, doesn't it? Uh, Norton Disney, there you go. Um, now, this this one's particularly particularly good. It's, uh, it's very well preserved. And... Lorena has done some very good measurements on it and what you'll find is that the side length of the faces are 27 millimeters not 48. 27 is quite a lot less than 48 um, and according to her it is an exceptionally large example although there is a larger one in the British Museum. So It's got a lot of lead in it, and again, lead is required to make it flow into the mould, but that makes this very soft. Anyway, there we go, 27 millimetres. Um, here's another one. This one was found, it's another complete one. Uh, this one was found in Much Haddam. There we go. Um, this one, uh, they don't give side lengths, but they do give face lengths. Each of the 12 faces is 38 millimeters in length. Now, I've got a pentagon calculator because I can't remember the, the scaling factor. So, let's go to height, 38 millimeters, we said. 38 millimeters brings us to a side length of about 25 millimeters. Okay still a lot smaller than 48. Um, now what else have we got? We've got one that was found in York. Um, so this is another, well, this one's partial, it's been busted and the problem with these is that they are quite fragile so they have been broken over time and a lot of the stuff that we've got is just little fragments like uh, you, know, so, you know you might find one knob or one edge. Um, if you've got one edge you can measure it, and they've got a lot of those on here. I have checked them. Um, so, again, approximate length of each face. So, you know, the length of each face, 38 millimetres. So that brings it down to about 25 mil again. Um, there's also, mentioned in here, is one which was, uh, which was found in South Shields, which has a length of 48 millimetres on each face. Well, 48 millimetres rather than 38 brings us to 31 millimetres side length. Now that really is quite big, but still a lot le a lot less than 48 millimetres. And you know I've been through all of the ones that are on finds. Um, 
an awful lot of the stuff that's European as well. There's been quite a few that have been found in Belgium, Germany and France, been through most of those. Um, haven't found anything bigger than the South Shields one, which is a bit of a bit of a worry for Matt's uh, for Matt's theory. Um, obviously, the bigger it gets, um, the more broken it's likely to be. Um, but there you go. Um, there's also the issue that the uh, the knobs on these are quite large relative to the uh, relative to the side length, um, whereas these holes are very small relative to the side length, uh, which means that these wouldn't work as Matt theorizes, even if we had well, okay, if the proportions are the same and we had a uh, a dodecahedron that was the right size, it would have to have proportionally very small knobs, and in fact physically much smaller than these. So, there's that too. Um, now, I think the trap that Matt's fallen into on this is that uh, it's the same thing as flat earthers. It looks like that, so that's what it is. Um, on the face of it, this image, as originally shown, uh, let's go back to here. That does look a bit like 72 degrees. It does look like a thing that could have been. It sort of looks a bit like the thing, but but hasn't done his bloody homework. It's frustrating. It's frustrating to see people not doing their homework. Now, I've got a lot of time for Matt. He's, um, he's not afraid to leave the criticism up in his comments. Although for some reason my comments appear to be blocked, I think it's probably because the first comment that I put on his uh, proof video had links to all this stuff um, and some other documentation in French and German and all the rest of it. Um, I don't think it's Matt that's blocked me, but uh, yeah, it's um, it's frustrating to see people get stuck in a completely unscientific mindset. Science is always, always, always about trying to prove itself wrong um, and not about trying to prove itself right. Um, and I think if Matt had pay, paid a little bit more attention to the science side of things, then his theory would be a lot more solid. Anyway, that's all I've got for you today, so um, we'll perhaps see you later. <laughs>